for the assurance that you are here with us. Waiting to bless us and to bring to our living such a sense of joy and peace and purpose as earth can ever give. Yours is a faithfulness that does not change or diminish with the passing of ages. Yours a love expressed in Jesus Christ at which we can only marvel. There is none like you in heaven or upon the earth to whom we should go with our prayers and our praising. So let the glory be yours, our God, this day and in all days. We thank you for today, for all that it brings to us of your love and concern for your creation. With light comes reawakening and fresh hope, the opportunity of new beginnings and the desire to be here in this place. And you are the source of it all. In Jesus Christ, all things are becoming new. And we need, long, we need no longer be cast down by the evidence of frequent failures. The promise of the Spirit's strengthening power is ours. And we can face life with gladness, offering you praise of grateful hearts. Lord, as we worship you, as we praise you, as we realize that you love us so much, we also realize that we are not the people you want us to be. We are not the people we long to be. Sometimes we reach out for the new life you offer us, but too often we are content with second best. Sometimes we glimpse eternal joy but too often we are content with passing pleasures. Sometimes we allow ourselves to share our neighbor's agony, but too often we are content to offer cheap sympathy. Sometimes we inspire to work for a better world, but too often we are content with self-righteous isolation. Sometimes we allow ourselves to believe in your love, but too often we act as if, we, as, as if you are not to be trusted. Father, this is our life. We are not satisfied with it. We long for it to be better. We know that you will accept us as we confess our failure and present ourselves now in the knowledge of our foolishness, our half-heartedness and our unnecessary fears. So we can claim that forgiveness now through Jesus Christ. Thank you that when we repent, we say that we're sorry and when we turn from our sin, you welcome us back and forgive us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As we prepare to listen to God's word this morning, uh, the children will go to Sunday school. Just to remind those parents that next Sunday... Um, if you could stay for some tea afterwards, if that isn't your tradition, but if you could do that next Sunday, because the children would like to practice up front here just to run through their play. So it'll be about 20 minutes if you can just wait behind after, after the service on Sunday and have a cup of tea while they just go through their play, which will be presented on the 29th. Um, and so we look forward to that. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we have come to your holy place today to hear you speaking to us through your word. We ask that you open our hearts to hear and accept the message that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first reading is the first of the the first reading is taken from 1 Samuel, 
chapter 1, verses 4 to 20. Thank you, Sir Pray. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something. And her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Our second reading today is taken from Hebrews 10, reading from verses 11 to 14 and 19 to 25, and we are found on page 265 of the, of the New Testament. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of his faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thank you. So we're uh, finished an exciting series in 
Revelation last week. And so we almost pause, as it were, and gather our breath as we are about to begin this season of Advent. Um, you see the shops are ahead of us already, so there's uh, stuff hanging from the, the roofs and lights and uh, the sale signs are out preparing us for the season. I've chosen uh, this morning to go back to the lectionary and in fact focus on the story of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And perhaps just to highlight some things that this story teaches us. And the first thing I would say is that it teaches us something about prayer. Three things we pray. Prayer meetings are the worst meetings at church. They're the worst attended. If you make an announcement uh, or you've got a group of people, we were just having a bit of a chuckle in the, as we were praying in the, in the vestry. If you've got a group of people and you say, um, sorry, can you just open in prayer for us? Or who will open in prayer for us? Suddenly people are... You know, they, they're looking at the paintings, they're tying their shoelaces. They Often I get invited to dinners, not because I'm a nice guy, because people want somebody to say grace. <coughs> Somehow they think the food is going to be more blessed <laughs> if the minister says grace. And often our, I think our reflection of, prayer, of praying and when we think about praying, is a bit like that little clip that we saw. We don't know what to say. We don't know what words to use. We think that in order for God to respond somehow, we've got to kind of get the prayer right. I want to suggest this morning that in fact, there is no magic formula to praying. If we asked for testimonies this morning in this room, many of you would say, prayer works. I can tell you a testimony. I can tell you a story of when I cried out to God and He answered my prayer. There are many of you that are sitting here as well that say, you know what? I'm not sure that prayer works. Because I've prayed. I've trusted. I've believed. Some of my prayer wasn't answered. So I don't think there's a secret to successful prayer. You know, we've just got to have enough faith. I mean, what does that mean? I've always I've said that before. What does enough faith mean? Is it 
How do you measure it? One, one meter? Two kilograms? You know, three tons? Four roomfuls? How do, you, how do you measure that? How do we know when we've got enough faith that somehow God is going to answer our prayers? No sin in our life. We've got to pray with the right attitude. You know, now, some of these things obviously are part of prayer. But I'm not sure that we'll be able to find that secret formula. If I do X, Y, and Z, my prayer is going to be answered. It's certainly going to be answered in the way that I've prayed. So I want to suggest this morning that the story of Hannah speaks about a woman's prayer life, but it speaks probably more importantly about a relationship with God and how that relationship affects our prayer life. If you look at the story, Hannah is a very unhappy woman. She is unable to have children. And as you have probably heard, whenever, because barrenness or, and people without children is a common sort of theme through the Old Testament, there are many women that struggle to have children. But in the ancient Near East, children were a sign of your inheritance. In fact, the concept of eternal life as, predict, as portrayed in the New Testament was not that well established in the Old Testament. They didn't really understand this idea fully about eternal life. And so part of the Jewish understanding was in fact that your eternal life, your inheritance, the continuation of your family, in fact, of your very existence was dependent on the fact that you had children. So in their understanding, you would cease to exist if there were no children, if you didn't have children, to carry on your name. There was, of course, no old age homes, no pension schemes. So your very survival, in fact, dependent on whether you had children to care for you. And, of course, it was also a sign of God's blessing. You can see that, and, and then we would say that the opposite was true. You can see the, 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 the writer says God had closed her womb. So that was the understanding. God, in fact, was not blessing her with children. She, she, she did not receive that blessing. And the fact that Elkanah had two wives was probably due to the fact that Hannah could not have children. We have this understanding that... Uh, <laughs> You know, men ran around and just had 40 wives. I mean, I don't know why you would do that. It's hard enough having one. <laughs> God, imagine having more than that. My wife's not here, so I can say that. <laughs> uh, but often, if your one wife could not have children, you would take another because, of course, it was about your inheritance, about your future. And not only had Hannah to deal with the comments in the marketplace, when, he, when she went to worship, when she walked around town, people looking at her slightly differently, you know, not being invited to the mother's club, uh, you know, not being seen pushing her pram you know, around town. Not only had she to deal with that slight, but the very place that should have been her sanctuary was not her home. Because Penina would remind her of a predicament. This went on year after year, we read in verse 7. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit more than just saying a few nasty words. <laughs> Hannah's husband, he's, he's, he's beautiful, he's a typical man. Eh? <laughs> Hannah, I love you. That's all that counts. You precious girl. Look, I'll give you gifts. I must admit, she, she probably would have liked the diamonds instead of a double portion of meat, but still. <laughs> you know, this is the classic one. Hannah, you don't need children. You have me, my darling. I'm more to you than 20 sons. So here is a woman who is in anguish. And she turns to God in prayer. It would seem somehow in this anguish, in this stressful, 
time of her life. She says, there is somebody that I can trust. There is somebody that will listen to me. There is somebody that understands me. And that is God. Now, I suppose if we talk about prayer, that's the simple definition. It is simply turning to God. It's communicating with God. But I think Hannah reminds us that prayer can be more than just speaking to God. That's, this is a quote by uh, one of the blogs that I read in preparation. It says, prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God, at God's disposition, and listening to God's voice in the depth of our hearts. More than just a shopping list. More than sometimes just the five minutes. Lord, uh, by the way, I just need these few things as I rush out. But as we grow our relationship with God, it needs to be when we get to that place, we are also hearing God's heart as He listens to our heartbeat and our cries. And so in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. The writer says, in the bitterness of her soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Rick Morley, another theologian, says this. He describes this process as waiting in prayer. So in her anguish, in her sadness, in her bitterness, Hannah waits in prayer. I see this as sharing our deepest hurts and pain with God. Our plans, our dreams, our deepest longings and our deepest joys. And who would we do this with? Normally people we trust. You're not going to tell your deepest, darkest secret to anybody. You're going to do it. You're going to share that with somebody that you know loves you. Somebody that you can trust. The the writer of the Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is that person. We can trust Christ because He gave His very life for us. We can enter into the most holy place because of Christ. Do we realize what a privilege that is? Sometimes we, we do that glibly. We, you know, God is, yes, God is our Father and He loves us. But this is the person who spoke and there was life. This is the person who conquered death. This is the person who raised Jesus from the death, defeated sin. And because of of Christ, we can come into God's very presence. That's a privilege. This holy place for me speaks of intimacy. It speaks of a place of trust. It speaks of being in the presence of God. It says, let us draw near to God with sincere, with a sincere heart, with a full assurance that faith brings. And I think that's what happens when we pray. We don't need to have a special setting, special words, or have somebody who is more qualified to do it on our behalf. You know, often people will come to me as a minister and say, you need to pray for Joe. Not sorry, just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's, he's going through a bad time. I was like, uh, so you can't pray for Joe? I'm not more qualified. You love God. You have a relationship with Jesus. It's on your heart. God's laid that burden on you to pray for this person, so go ahead, pray for them. Don't need somebody qualified. In fact, the story indicates a bit of of that. She goes right past the priest, right past the religious rules, right past the tradition. She goes to the very person who she believes can help her, God her Father. And we have that same privilege. 
we can run into the arms of our Saviour, pour out our hearts to Him. Because that's what prayer is. Secondly, I think this story talks about the purpose, that, that the purposes of God always move forward. The purposes of God always move forward. Okay, now I got into trouble for this because um, <laughs> I told her that she was going to be part of today's sermon and um, yeah, she wasn't that impressed. But anyway, she's not here, so there. <laughs> but this is Hannah, uh, not the mother of Samuel. <laughs> Her name means God's grace, and that's why we chose the name. We lost three children, one when Debbie was eight months pregnant, before we had Hannah. Now, I must admit, as I think back on that time, I was probably not in a good place in my Christian walk. Yet somehow God, in His grace and mercy, blessed us with a baby girl, and in fact two more children after that. And I loves the Lord Jesus, despite the pretty ordinary example of her father. She's passionate about children, especially those with special needs, and that's what she wants to dedicate her life to at the moment. And we'll probably be studying in that field. Now, why did I tell this story? And I thought carefully about using my own family <laughs> as uh, an example or a story or a whatever you want to call it. I tell the story because we are not a special family. In fact, probably the opposite. I tell the story because, like Hannah in the Bible, God's purposes move forward despite often what happens in family situations. You see, Hannah in the Bible will give birth to Samuel. And Samuel will be one of the most famous prophets who will guide the people of Israel in the ways of the Lord. He will be the prophet that will lead the people into the reign of their first kings. He will be used by God to choose those first kings of Israel. He will anoint King David. And we know that King David will be part of of the genealogy of Joseph, who is the father of Jesus. Part of God's purposes. Part of God's plan. Out of pain. Out of suffering. See, Hannah doesn't give up hope. She turns to God in prayer. She trusts that He will answer. Year after year, she keeps going up to the temple, begging God for a child. And God hears her. So this morning, whatever pain and anguish you're experiencing at this moment, let's remember Hannah. Because God's plan for our lives will not be stopped. Hannah is never mentioned in the Bible again. Yet she helped create a legacy. Let's not underestimate what God can do and will do with what seems to be a messy and untidy life. And so perhaps as we reflect this morning on our messy and untidy lives, perhaps as we look at where we stand in our spiritual walk, we don't feel very close to Jesus. We're experiencing pain and suffering. It's been a long year and we're tired the last thing we feel like doing is praying. People have let us down. Relationships have broken. Those we have reached out have not listened properly and have not really understood us. But this morning, we too, like Anna, can come to God our Father who does understand and will listen and will answer our prayer. Hannah's encounter with God and it's interesting that God doesn't speak to Hannah as we look at the text. She's standing there pleading, begging. God doesn't speak to her. There's no voice from heaven. And often, isn't that what we expect our prayer life to be like? That's why we get discouraged because we sit in the silence in our rooms crying out to God and there is just silence. 
And it must have been the same for Hannah. It's the voice of Eli. The voice of Eli that says, Go in peace. May God the Father of Israel grant you what you have asked. And it's those words that bring her peace and hope. I think I'm behind you. So we've met God this morning and we'll continue to meet Him as we go from this place. And may we also know in our hearts that the God of this world has heard our prayers. And finally, no matter how messed up we think our lives are, God has a plan for those who love Him and are committed to serve Him. God's will for our lives will be achieved despite perhaps the pain and the suffering we're experiencing right now. If we listen to the words in Hebrews, the writer reminds us to continue to draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance and hold holding on to that hope. Why? Because he who has promised is faithful. Let us remember the example of Hannah, who was persistent in prayer, and in the end, was part of God's plan to bring salvation to the world. Amen. Let's pray.